vision received was that of blood cells traveling throughout the body, supplying the much needed oxygen and other nutrients to the differing members of the body to fulfill their purpose. Once the blood cells are spent, they must return back to the heart to be refilled before being sent out again and fulfill their purpose. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of our Father's Heart podcast. This is one of those special ones where uh, we take the time out to speak directly to you. This is not a pre-recorded session of something that I had shared in the past, but this is one that uh, we wanted to uh, do live and and have it with your uh, with uh, with you in mind. Um, today's a uh, series or episode probably will become a series depending on how long I take, <laughs> um, is on shepherding a child's heart, basically parenting. And uh, it's kind of been uh, on my mind, on my heart, if I've spoken with my wife uh, recently about doing this. And I thought I would uh, ask my eldest if she wanted to be a part of it. And so I have both of them here with me. Hello. Hi. Do they sound the same? We were doing a microphone check before we got started, and one of them said, oh my God, we sound the same. So I'll let you guys be the judge of that. Um, but before we get started, um, I've got two books in front of me, and I want to start off this series for all those parents that might be listening that are wondering, gosh, what resources could I look to that are trusted, that are respected, that have been used by others, and they have found success. And so if you kind of have that esteem for us and, uh, you know, our father's heart, uh, we will both, my wife and I will both uh, readily uh, recommend, highly recommend, um, Shepherding a Child's Heart that was written by Ted Tripp. Uh, this one probably made the most impact on us and 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 how, gave us sort of a, uh, a schematic of how we should be raising our children and how to have the word be the foundation of the decisions that we make in regards to raising our children. Uh, this one is the one that was most memorable for us because um, in our previous fellowship, we actually did, is that right? We did a special um, yes. ministry time with the parents in our previous fellowship and kind of laid out a lot of these uh, um concepts um, to them so that they could find ways to properly apply those in their homes. Uh, but the other book um, is called Boundaries with Kids. This one was written by Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. This one was another very good book. There's a actually a boundary series. Uh, I think boundaries in general. Uh, there's boundaries in marriage. There's boundaries with kids. And there may be some other ones. I don't know all of them, but I know that this particular book um, gave us more um, practical ways to apply um, a lot of biblical principles that you might not think are biblical principles, but they they actually were. Um, so we highly recommend both of these two books, Shepherding a Child's Heart by Ted Tripp. That's Ted with a double D, Tripp with a double P. And then you have Boundaries with Kids. And again, there's a series of boundaries by Dr. Gen Dr. Excuse me, Dr. Henry Cloud and Dr. John Townsend. Um, but again, today's focus is really on shepherding a child's heart. And what I'd like to do uh, with this particular series um, in having my wife and, and my daughter here is I, I'd like to go over some of the uh, elements in an outline form. I'm not going in depth and reading the book to you, but I wanted to pull out some of the important uh, things that I felt were, were very important that we applied um, in raising our children. And as I do that, um, I've kind of opened it up to my wife and, and my daughter that if there's anything that I've said that they want to kind of comment, interject, and give some feedback to just give me a motion so that I'll kind of stop it at a certain point, um, and then we'll, we'll, you know, have at it and, and see what, um, what what exchange and dialogue we can have uh, concerning it. 
Um, they have notes on their own, so hopefully there will be a, a time and opportunity in this podcast that they can share some things that um, I, I, my daughter is probably going to come out with questions uh, on maybe why we did things or, or maybe have an understanding of why we did things now. And then um, my wife here probably has a better memory than I do on how we raised our kids and details that I probably don't remember. Um, so I'm hoping that she'll be able to kind of, uh, kind of me give the skeleton and she'll give the meat, uh, to a lot of this. So in shepherding a child's heart, uh, probably the most important, um, point that was made, and it was right at the beginning was about authority, authority. We all live under authority. It doesn't matter what setting you find yourself in. Um, for those that, you know, are Christians that confess to be Christian, almighty God is our authority. Jesus is our authority. But if you have, you know, followed us along in many of our teachings, you, you'd realize through the scriptures that, um, he has vested authority in institutions that he has established, starting with first and foremost, the, the, the first one that we all come to recognize is home. He has established authority in the home. First and foremost, he's established authority in the church. He's established authority in governments, although we might not like that, but he has established authority in governments. He has established authority in business. Um, and we need to recognize that because in everything we do, there is not a area in our life where... Um, there is not some authority of some kind uh, inherent in, in some person who's holding some position um, that we must abide by. Um, as parents, we have been given authority as God's agent over our children. And so we, being parents, must not direct them just for our own convenience just to fulfill our own agenda, to kind of get them out of our way so that we can live life the way, you know, that we want to and kind of uh, um, very selfish in, in that way. But no, it's it, it, our authority being that it comes from God, um, we must direct them on God's behalf for their good, according to his will, according to his word, according to his ways, and not just because we think we have a bright idea. Uh, of something that, that that we think is good. So, did anybody want to comment on that or anything? No? Okay, okay. So, we'll move on. So, uh, as we continue reading in the book, he goes from authority then to shepherding. And he states that the best description of the activity between a parent and a child is shepherding. And I firmly, completely agree with that. Um when we are shepherds, we are overseen. That's what a shepherd is. Uh, I've talked about this in other podcasts that, well, maybe not in other podcasts, but in my other uh, teachings in our home, that the word bishop, the word um, pastor, uh, the word elders, um, presbytery, um, even the qualifications of a deacon, they all are so interchangeable uh, that you come to realize that all of those are basically serving the same function. They may just have synonymous terms. And shepherding is a term that we connote with a pastor, but shepherding is basically what a bishop does, an overseer, what an elder does. They are overseeing the flock in a church. And so in a home, parents are the shepherds. They are the shepherds of everyone in the home. Um, and we need to kind of embrace that and realize that. Now, not only when we're talking about the parent and child relationship, we don't want to solely address the what of a child's actions. Behavior. That's surface level. Right. That's outward. That's, that's, you know, genotype, phenotype. That's phenotype. That's stuff that happens outwardly, external. We have to get to the root and the root is always found in the heart. Everything that we do, everything that we say is founded or rooted in something that we're believing in our heart. 
And so we have got to, being that we're older, being that we are more mature, we have to help guide our children in recognizing that the actions that they're taking are rooted in something that's going on in their heart. If it's anger and they lashed out and they hit somebody or they, <laughs> and we've seen this before, uh, they have a hard time sharing their toys. So once they see their friend having their toy, they go snatch their toy and take it back. And it's the easy way to parent that is to say, Johnny, don't do that. That's, un you know, that, that. Give that back to him. Let it, you know, share your toys and, and you stay on the surface. But really what you have to do is show Johnny that Johnny, you have, you know, you have this toy. This is your toy all day long. Your friend just came. He's only going to be here for an hour. Why wouldn't you share that with him? What, what's wrong with that? And start delving deeper into why he felt like he needed to take that back and take it away. And hopefully you find that rooted in that behavior was, it's just selfishness. Uh, or it's just an, a, a, a mark of pride. That's mine. Give me that. That's mine. What? You know? And, and then so that give that carnality, which we're now we're speaking in spiritual terms, is really what hinders us from fully maturing in Christ spiritually. And so we have to shepherd them into understanding and recognizing that about themselves. Um, so we also shepherd our child's thoughts. We teach him as shepherds, as parents, to learn to discern, to learn wisdom. It even says of Jesus that he grew in wisdom and in stature, in favor with God and man. He had to grow into that. And, and, and our children have to grow into that. Okay. And then he also talked about how we as parents must invest our lives in them. And I think what hit me the most, because a lot of times when you think about parenting, you think about the fact that you, you, you know, you have to discipline and, and disciplining is not something that maybe a lot of people feel comfortable with, although some do and others don't. Um, but this really hit me because I, I guess in, in, in my thoughts, even though I might have not have been raised that way, um, I thought parenting was about, you know, disciplining the child. But one of the things that Ted Tripp focuses on is that when we invest our life in them, it's not just merely as get them in line, give the discipline, give them the time out, give them whatever consequence, but no, it's through open, this is how he relates it, open and honest communication. And when you establish that dialogue with your child from very early on, and it continues to last and progress over the lifetime um, they begin to understand the meaning and the purpose of their own life. What was it? Was it through the, the, the consequences? No. Was it through the disciplinings? No. Was it through the timeouts? No. It was through the open and honest communication that a mother or father has with their child and helping them understand things about themselves that they're not aware of. And so if Either of you can read me a particular scripture, Proverbs 13, verse 20. And this is one biblical example of what I'm trying to describe here. Go ahead. He who walks with wise men will be wise. But? Oh, it's not. Go ahead. Read the next one. Not on. Oh, it's not on it's there. It's not on the document. Okay, then I'll read. I'll finish it. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So, parenting is shepherding your child's heart in the ways of God's wisdom. That's, that's what's been delegated to us to do. No one else can do that. No one else in the scriptures has been given that authority. It wasn't you know, written in the, in the scriptures that the teachers have to teach that to the children, that the bosses have to teach that to the, to, to, you know, their, their employees. It, it, it wasn't given to the church. Really. It was really first and foremost, the parents, not that the church can't help and, and, um, support, but really the, the main responsibility and accountability falls with the parents. So, um, you know, then we move on into this idea of the totality of God's words or God's word, the central focus of our parenting. 
what does it need to be on? It needs to be focusing on God's word. We're not trying to impart unto them our bright ideas. We're fallible. We're human. We may have been raised in a certain way that was not correct. And we think that just because we were raised that way that, well, that's what I have to teach my children because that's the way it was done with me. And that's the way I know. But if, if, if you're, if you're apprehended by the Lord, if you are captured by the Lord, if you're rescued by the Lord, and you realize that you've been um, translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, that that kingdom of light has laws, has procedures, has protocols, has ways that the king wants things to be done in order to rule in peace, in order to rule in order. And so, again, as parents, we tend to focus on the behavior, about what they did, what was their sin. But that's all exterior. That's all stuff that's outward. And we need to redirect the focus to applying God's word to the attitudes of their hearts, which is interior. It cannot be focused solely on the outward. It must go to the interior. You know, there, there's a saying, um, I think I, we learned it in psychology and both my wife and I took psychology. We got our bachelor's in it. We ended up getting our master's in special education as well. But when we were in psychology, do you remember what they taught us about motivation? There's two kinds. Right. You want to have the intrinsic motivation. Uh -huh. Why? Be intrinsic meaning internal because external, if you're always like giving rewards, you know, candy, whatever, to get a, a child to perform, it doesn't, it's not coming from within them. So it's, it's not, it won't. It won't be permanent. It won't be long term. Okay. Whereas if you can uh, guide them to intrinsic reward, there it's something that's important to them and it stays with them. It's mm -hmm. not just a momentary, oh, I got a piece of candy. Yeah. But more like, oh, I really want to do well. And that becomes part of their motivation. Yeah. And do we see a lot of that in parenting today? Yes. <laughs> Yes. How? how? <laughs> Go ahead. Give some, some examples. How do I mean, we see that in parenting today? This external motivation is emphasized well, one, rather one than internal. One, that's a big controversy that we've talked around, uh -oh. the, around the table. Is Are we going to get canceled? Well, the oh, kid, we just let the kids have phones to oh, yeah. kind of get them. It, it serves as two purposes. It's a reward to them, but it's also a way to get them focused and quiet. And But what, you know, we're opening up another can of worms with that. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of parents just give in uh, to whatever a child is. I, I see this in the stores. I see this with some saints, and it, it saddens me that if a child, you know, gets upset about something, then right away you promise them, oh, when we get home, I'm going to, you know, make you something or you're going to get something special. Mm -hmm. And then that's, you're, it, it, you're kind of rewarding the, you're, you're creating something. You're creating the Skinner's, you know, behaviorism of, the, the Pavlov dog, you know, you get the yes. treat and, and it becomes a, it becomes that. And so that classical conditioning. Was yeah. That, I don't remember called? all Pavlovian. the terms with B.F. No. Skinner and all those yes. people in yes. psychology yes. that um, you don't want that. You don't want that to be, it's a, you know, just like a, if you do this, I do that conditional. Mm -hmm. I guess it's conditional because then their behavior, their response, their reaction to things is always conditional on something that they're going to, a reward that they're going to get yeah. and not just a, you know, intrinsic of, Ooh, if I act right, my, you know, my parents are going to be happy with me. If we act right, our heavenly father. Or it's going to satisfy my soul. Right. I'm going to have a well, sense of peace. For that reason, yeah. because he creates us to be, to walk in obedience. Yeah. Although we live in a world that's not obedient. So. Well, I think there was a, something you said just as you started. Uh, when you started describing what external motivation does, you said the word performance. Yeah, it puts you on a performance trap. And that's that's what we don't want. I mean, uh, we know what performance does to us when we're in the church, when we're trying to walk with Christ. We carry that with us and we feel like we need to perform for our Lord Jesus. And we don't recognize that our Lord Jesus loves us mm -hmm. in spite of our sin. He's not condoning our sin. But man, he, he loves us 
And he is not there trying to get us to perform like some seal who wants to get a fish, Mm -hmm. you know, and do some trick. He's not interested in that. He's interested in the heart and the heart is intrinsic. Now, you brought up the cell phone. The cell phone is something that we've talked about. We've been talking about it for probably weeks and months now that we just see it so often. We know we see, I shared it in January. I said, (laughs) you know, I see parents. They have their young children and I cringe because what they do to get their child under control is they give them a a cell phone or something that looks like a cell phone, like a switch or an iPad or a mini and and they just get them involved in a game, get them involved in watching some cartoon, some animation thing. And that's what settles them down. And they didn't realize the unintended consequences of doing that. Now, I bring that up because you brought it up, <laughs> but I bring that up because recently I posted on, on on social media through our father's heart on Facebook and on, on Twitter and some other ones. Um, the Surgeon General just came out with advisory about the adverse effects of social media. He actually did it. And I was very surprised under this, <laughs> you know, uh, regime that we have. Um, he came out and he talked about what are some of the growing concerns of social media on children. And I just want to read a few of them. I've posted this. You guys can find it. It's the Surgeon General. His name is Vivek, I think. Totally forgot his last name. Uh, I think it's Vivek Murthy, I think it is. But anyways, he came out recently with a report. It's called Social Media and Youth Mental Health, the U.S. Surgeon's General's Advisories. There's an executive summary, which is only a two page, and you'll just get all the bullet points that you need as a parent to realize, oh my gosh, I really need to reconsider whether I need to allow my children to be involved in social media. But some of the things that that he listed here. Social media may perpetuate body dissatisfaction, disordered eating behaviors, social comparison, and low self-esteem, especially among adolescent girls. Now, let me tell you something. When he came out with this report, I didn't need to know this. It's like I, I didn't need to re, I didn't need to have a report from the Surgeon General to let me know that that was true. I've seen that. I've I've lived that in as a teacher in the public school setting. I've lived that with with uh, my children in my own home. You know, not that we've experienced all of these things, but I've realized, yeah, I, I knew that already. I'm, but I'm just glad that he put it out there. Kind of like you know, a few years ago, we were glad that finally the Surgeon General put out that smoking causes cancer unabashedly, you know? Um, But the next thing it says, when asked about the impact of social media on their body image, 46% of adolescents ages 13 through 17 said that social media makes them feel worse. That's nearly 50% of the adolescents. 40% made it feel like neither better nor worse. And only 14% said it makes them feel better. So it's more on the negative side that these uh, effects are happening. Roughly two thirds of adolescents are often or sometimes exposed to hate based content. Now you got to figure what does that mean? (laughs) How do you define hate based concept? (laughs) You know, could it be when a Christian just says, I love the Lord Jesus and we we were not going to walk in that particular lifestyle that you chosen. They might say, oh, that's hate based concept. I don't know what they meant by that, but This is one I think we can all relate to because it actually happened in our high school. You know, we've had graduates that have come into our high school and within a year, they committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And that's been unfortunate. It says some social media platforms show suicide and self-harm related content, including even live depictions of self-harm acts, content which in certain tragic cases has been linked to childhood deaths. Mm -hmm. Now, we've seen that. We've known that. But to actually put it in a report and say that, hey, there is a correlation that you need to be aware of and you probably need to do something about it. Lydia, what what do you want to share? Yeah, I can, for me, I can speak a little bit on social media since I lived it as a student, but also looking back now as someone who's about to be an educator and being quite worried because I saw it starting 
it wasn't that it wasn't there, but things like, for example, when I came into high school and Mm -hmm. high school was my first year of public school, for those of you who've been listening to podcasts, you guys know that we were homeschooled up until high school. So my first year of public school, they introduced uh, technology for all students, iPads in our case. And the first year they didn't have restrictions. So everybody was on Snapchat. That was the thing uh, for my Mm -hmm. ninth grade year. And a lot of people are on it. I eventually did get off of it. I think my first or second year of college, just because I realized I didn't necessarily... So it took you four years? Yes, because you <laughs> talk every day. You just snap. It's stories. So what Facebook and all these other platforms have done is they've all kind of taken from each other yeah. to market to a bigger audience. Mm-hmm. But Snapchat, originally, you could send little pictures, funny little filters, some people take pictures of the floor or the ceiling in class and just type little messages, I'm bored. And just go back and forth um, in class, kind of like texting. Uh, but also you could look at someone's stories and see what they were up to, if they were doing something fun or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I think the limit was 10 seconds. I also know Twitter was big in high school for a lot of people my age. That being said, I was not allowed to have Twitter, mm-hmm. so I never was on it. But I heard about repercussions. So going back to what you said about situations where you've seen the harm of it. I actually saw the harm of it, not necessarily just for kids. I saw the harm of it on adults by kids on social media. So in my Uh, case, I can think of two specific instances. There was one where there was something that was tweeted as started as a joke. Mm -hmm. And the person who put it did not intend for it to um blow up as blow it up as it did but yeah. it ended up blowing up and it ended up um hurting a staff on one of our on, on my soccer team mm-hmm. um and it was and it was to the point where not only did she see it because she wasn't even really active on her twitter her mother saw it and right. her little brother saw it yeah. and so that affected her whole family i remember it caused so much tension and eventually this led to this coach being let go in my team, there was a lot of politics around that. But that wasn't of, the reason, but that, that, the that reason. was part of the multiple varying factors. That Exactly. Yeah, that it wasn't that. the reason, but yeah. there was many factors. And this was one major one where I think it started that downhill snowball mm-hmm. for this particular individual. Another instance I can think of is I wasn't even at the school, but I heard about it because, again, this was in the athlete realm in the mm-hmm. school, but it was a school wide thing was there was an incident in the community with a staff member um, regarding an accident. And Uh, this particular individual coached uh, one of the athletic teams. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And not only did this person get a lot of online hate for what had happened, um, but all the girls, all the individuals she coached, a lot of people were targeting them, asking them, how could you in good conscience play for such a person um, just a lot of online bullying to wow. people as That's low right. as eighth grade. Um, yeah, you're reminding me. That was, was very early on. Yeah. Um, we, social media could be vicious. Vicious. That's yeah. a great word. Yes. <laughs> and we saw it early on. You're right. Um, because, you know, there's always been in the public school setting some sort of drama mm-hmm. between kids, you know, and, and maybe you didn't, you weren't aware of it or, or, um, Something like that. But when you when you get it on social media, it amplifies and makes what might have been just a small anthill. It makes it this huge boulder hill mountain type of thing that it never needed to be. Mm-hmm. But social media always seems to amplify these extreme emotions and cause a lot of collateral damage. So something that might have happened in school between kids and eh, whatever. But then it gets on social media. Now the mom knows about it. Now the aunt knows about it. Now the cousin knows about it. And then everybody wants to get together and say, hey, what's going on at that school? And then, People oh, within wow. the community. It's a mob. It's not even yeah. just limited to a community anymore. What social media has done, for better or for worse, has opened the world up to people. The world is literally at your fingertips. Yeah. So anyone associated with your social media account can see anything. And they don't even have to live in your community. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's even how news outlets outlets might catch wind of things yeah. and show up uh, wanting answers and whatnot. And so we've seen that within our own community happen a few times. But in terms of my experience as a student, I know for me, 
yes, there's the feeling of being left out, which might pressure a lot of people to have social media. Yeah. And that's where it is so vital that parents do step in and have those boundaries set in place and be there for your children and definitely explain the why, because they're, they're not going to get it. I can say for myself, I didn't see the harm necessarily in Snapchat. I did see the harm in Twitter just because of these experiences, Mm -hmm. but someone who may have not had a negative experience could think, no, there's no way I I don't conduct myself that way. And you may not, but maybe your peers do. And God knows if you make just one mistake, um, that could be blown up for the world to see. And if you remember, in our particular high school, we had been instructing our kids, and this came from the top down, if you remember our principal, constantly telling us and telling our kids, the things that you do on social media Mm -hmm. will never go away, Mm -hmm. and it will come back to haunt you later. Now, if you've been paying attention the last five or six years, that's really come to pass, and it's really hit the right in a major way major way things that they said in the past thing i mean you didn't realize it was going to get to that that you just thought oh it's going to be maybe your future job is not going to like it that they saw you at a party or blah 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 but man it it when you it's one of the reasons why social media should uh you need to really think about how you share your private life there's a reason why you have a private life it's supposed to be private for you your family, private. It's not supposed to be built, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, exposed to the whole world. It's That's none of their business. Why are we giving our private lives out to the whole world? There's really no need for that. So now back to this Surgeon General warning, and I'm glad you brought that up. That's, that's, did great bringing that up. In that, in that report, it says on a typical weekday, nearly one in three adolescents report using screens until midnight Mm -hmm. or later. Mm -hmm. Studies have shown that there is a relationship between excessive social media use and poor sleep quality, reduced sleep duration, sleep difficulties, and depression among youth. Mm -hmm. One third or more of girls age 11 to 15 say they feel addicted to certain social media platforms. And over half of teenagers report that it would be hard to give up social media. I just heard recently, I don't know if you heard this. There was a survey or some sort of report that said that young Americans would forego or forsake their voting privileges in order to keep TikTok. Who gets the vote? Not 16-year-olds, not 15-year-olds, 18-year-olds, right? That's when we start to vote, 18, 19. They said that they would rather keep their TikTok and forsake their voting privileges in America. Um, oh, wow. It's not surprising it's because we've seen the ex- um, explosion, is that a good word, mm-hmm. of the use of TikTok in our school. Uh, you know, just watching kids do TikTok videos and you know, some adults admitting that they're, they spend their time, all their time doing that. And then, so then tying it back to shepherding a child's heart, which I know we're going to talk about, but if a child is watching their parents do that, what do we think they're going to do? You know, what kind of messages are we sending to our children if we're always on our phones Mm -hmm. and inevitably even the best of us, I can be found guilty of that at times. We're so engrossed in the phone, we're not tuning into something that's going on around us mm-hmm. in a situation the Lord has us in. So, you know, it's it's a it's a discipline to set it to set it aside. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely something that I believe the Lord is is um uh calling us out of it. And, and and in previous generations, because we want to talk about phones and social media, in previous generations it was TV. That was the that was the box, that was the bad box that so many educators Mm -hmm. or homeschooling families or, you know, Christian, there's even Christian denominations that say it's evil and nobody should have a TV in their house. Mm -hmm. So it just, the phones and, and, and computers sort of started substituting and creating a, a little bit more, a diversion or, or, you know, something that we get engaged in because it's at our fingertips all the time where the TV was in a set place 
now we've got our phones where we could we could tap into not just social media netflix there's just it's it's constant bombardment of information that mm -hmm. comes to us through the phone and again our children are watching what we're doing the little and, and, the and, little, and, little guys and everybody. for the most part social media usage is unsupervised whereas with the tv that was pretty supervised y'all are at home we're gonna watch the news at seven o'clock you know, we're going to watch this and the parents were there, but on social media, that child has it and who knows what they're seeing, what they're going to. And so we also need to think about the fact that you brought up the TV. The TV was more for entertainment purposes. Why are we watching TV? Well, we want to be entertained. Why? Well, maybe we want to escape. We want to escape from our real world reality. We want to, you know, lose ourselves instead of reading a book. We'll lose ourselves in the movie. We'll lose ourselves in the TV show and the sitcom and we'll get entertained and we'll laugh and ah. Uh, but in social media, it ramps it up mm -hmm. because the child, why does the child want to be on social media? Why do they want to record themselves? Why do they want to promote themselves, flaunt themselves out like that? Oh my gosh, there's a, there's a myriad of whys. They want attention. Mm -hmm. They're crying out for help. Um, Everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is doing it, so they're just learning how to succumb to the peer pressure, the group think. Mm -hmm. That's what's really social media is another adverse reaction. You can easily get involved in group think mm -hmm. a lot easier. You know, you have children that are are kind of confused about about their their you know their gender identity or whatever. And then they get on the, the social media and bam, they get caught, they get glued to a certain, you know, little group that, that wants to flaunt about, oh yeah, you got to have, you know, a mass mastectomy, you got to have your drugs, you got to have, you got to pump yourself with estrogen, you got to pump yourself with testosterone, depending on which sex you weren't trying to change to, and you're not, and then all of a sudden you went down something that uh, is incredibly regrettable for many, many uh, people that have now detransitioned and come out of it. And one of the thing, the major thing that they, that many of them say is that what led me down the path was early getting on social media. That's what they've said themselves. Mm -hmm. And then they met this person who was all about flaunting and doing this and that and the other. And it, it's, it's unfortunate, but these are the things that we are dealing with today. And social media is a major, major component. And that's why if we establish from early on in children's lives, the why are you doing this? Not just that you did it, why are you doing this? That's gonna hopefully help you be able to engage in these other more adult conversations regarding social media when they get to that age. Um, we have to address the why because they must understand why they have sinned mm -hmm. and recognize their own internal process, processes for leading to engaging in that sin. Because if they never do, they're more likely going to commit it again because they didn't recognize where they fell. And so that's important for us to uh, to uh, to for to help them understand. So in this book, thus is the ministry of our Father's heart through us. Our utmost desire is to be in the Father's heart, to know the Father's heart, and express the Father's heart to you. If you appreciate listening to this podcast and we're blessed, pass it along to someone else by text, email, or word of mouth in the hopes that they might be positively impacted as you were. If you are interested in supporting our efforts, we would ask you to consider the following. One, pray for us. Two, leave a positive rating or review with whomever you listen to our podcast with. And three, if you desire to contribute monetarily, you can do so at paypal.me slash J Ben Jesus or Cash App dollar sign J Ben Jesus or Venmo J Ben Jesus that's J B E N J E S U S God bless